good to see you all here today and all of you joining from the live stream. How many are happy to be in the house of the Lord? Can you say amen? I want to remind you that on January 9th, the plan is still to go to two services, unless the Omarion virus has something to see, the Omarion variant, blast that Omarion. Um, remember when we thought COVID was over? Wasn't that nice? <laughs> so we're going to... Um, we're going to see, but we're still planning to go to two services on January 9th, and we're believing God to do a marvelous Amen. work in our midst. Amen. The Lord is here right now. Amen. Those of you who are joining us online, the Lord is with you as well. Yeah. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present, and that means that he can be here and there and everywhere all at the same time. Yeah. But when we take a moment to gather together to be with God, to yeah. be in his presence, there's something that happens that transcends what we experience on the one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. But that experience can also go to your home. Uh, we're going to finish up our, our Christmas series today. It's the four-part series entitled, The Story of No. Yeah. The Story of No. We started with Joseph's No Way. Yeah. He found out that uh, Mary, his, the love of his life, was pregnant with somebody else's baby. And his heart said, no way. Yeah. But God changed his no way into a yes, Lord. Yeah. And the story continued. And then uh, it's just about time for Mary to have the baby. And suddenly a decree is issued by Caesar Augustus that everybody has to register for the census in the hometown of their, of their tribe. Yeah. And so there's no time. Yeah. And Joseph and Mary, in the last trimester of her pregnancy, yeah. have to make the journey to Bethlehem so that they can register for the census. There's no time, but what they didn't realize is that their no time was God's appointed time. Yeah. Yeah, that God true. positioned them sovereignly, moved them sovereignly, used the crisis to move them sovereignly to the place where he had destined them to be. And we yeah. talked about how oftentimes crises experienced in our lives seem like they're moving us off track. Yeah. I was on track until this crisis came, yeah. but the crisis is actually moving us on track. Yeah. And we can't see it through our own eyes, but God sees it through his eyes. Yeah. And then the story should have ended right there because they get to Bethlehem and there's no room. Yeah. They should have all frozen to death out in the cold. But God transformed no room into a sacred space. He took the manger, which was a dirty place, and turned it into a clean place. It was an ugly place, and he turned it into a beautiful place because that's what God does. He takes us as we are, and he cleanses us, and he washes us, and he heals us. And so last week we talked about how none of us have to clean ourselves up before coming to God. We come to God as we are, and he cleans us up. We never have to make ourselves presentable. You can't, we can't make ourselves presentable. We simply have to present ourselves to him and fall upon his mercy and he accepts us just as we are, and he cleanses us. Well, now, in today's story, we're going to see that there's no rest. First, there was no way, then there was no time, and then there was no place. And now, there's no rest. And I'm in the book of Luke chapter 2, book of Luke, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. Yeah. I'm going to just read two verses of scripture to you, Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. I'm going to read them to you out of the New King James Version, and then we're going to break it down. We're going to talk about what's happening in this passage of Scripture. Matthew 2.13, this is what it says. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. I'll read 15 too. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Father, I pray today in the name of the Lord Jesus that you would give us clarity and understanding as we approach your holy word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now what's happening in this passage of scripture, this chapter here, Matthew chapter 2, begins with this group of people called the Magi, or the wise men, and it says that they came from the east, these 
wise men came from the east and they go to Jerusalem and they appear before King Herod and they say, they ask him a question. They were dignitaries and because they were dignitaries from afar, they were given access to the presence of the king and they say to him, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come. These guys knew anything about Jesus. How it is that these guys on the other side of the world knew that the child was being born who would be king of the Jews. And how they knew that this star meant that a child was being born who was the king of the Jews. And they knew to pick up everything and to stop everything and to follow that star and to come looking for Jesus. We have no idea what transpired in their lives, whether an angel appeared to them or if God just downloaded revelation. But it's interesting to me that the people that he came to there in Jerusalem had no clue, but people from afar had clarity and revelation. That people who were actually willing to seek him were not related to him, but the people who were related to him were not willing to seek him. And, and that's, that, is, that is so typical, isn't it? That sometimes people outside of the church are more hungry for God than people inside of the church. That sometimes the people who are related to him are the last ones to seek him. Now, these wise men came from the east. It's interesting that they come from the east because in the Bible, the east does not fare very well. You go back to the book of Genesis and you see uh, in Genesis... Um, uh, first of all, we see uh, Cain yeah. in the book of Genesis. Uh, in Genesis 4.16, the scripture said that Cain, after he killed his brother Abel, he went out from the presence of the Lord and wandered in the land of Nod. Where was that? In the east. So Cain wandered to the east. When he went out from the presence of the Lord, when he went away from the presence of the Lord, he went to the east. So the east is first and foremost the place for rebels. That's where rebels hang out. They hang out in the east. And then secondly, there's this guy Lot in Genesis 13, verse 11. The scripture says, remember Lot and Abraham. Lot was Abraham's nephew, and Lot was rich. Abraham was rich. Abraham had flocks and herds. Lot had flocks and herds. Abraham had servants. Lot had servants. And the land was too small to support them both. And Abraham said, you tell me which direction you're going to go, and I'll go the other way. If you go east, I'll go west. If you go west, I'll go east. And Lot looked to the east and saw that the land was well watered like the land of the Jordan. And also there were these two cities over there, two towns called Sodom and Gomorrah. He saw that the party was going on in the east. And so he said, I'm going to go over towards the party over here. Because the east is the place where the revelers go. The east is the place where the party people go. The east is the place where the rebels go. But the east is also the place where the revelers go. And you know what happened? That Lot went to the east and Abraham went to the west and Lot fell deeper and deeper into the debauchery that was happening there in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to the extent that he had to be rescued from it by the angel of the Lord before God would pour out his judgment upon those towns. And so the east doesn't fare well. And then finally, in Genesis chapter 25, verse 6, Uh, Abraham had many sons and many daughters from many different women, but Isaac was the one that God chose to be the heir of promise. And so in Genesis 25, 6, Abraham sent away all of his sons and daughters from all of his concubines. He gave them gifts, and then he said, y'all got to go. He sent them to the east. So the east is the place where the rejects go. So over there in the east, you've got rebels, revelers, and rejects. That's what lives in the east from the biblical perspective. But suddenly from the east is coming wise men. Suddenly from the east is coming wise men who have clarity and revelation. So how is it that you have rebels, revelers, and rejects in the east? How can wise men come from revelers, rebels and rejects. I'll tell you why. Because number one, they got some revelation. You see, all of us in some way, shape, or form at some time in our lives were the rebel or the reveler or the rejects. 
There's somebody here in this place right now, you can look back on your life and say, I was the rebel like Cain who killed his brother Abel. I was out in them streets, know what I'm saying? I was out there laying it down. I was banging like that because I was a rebel. That's what I was. But suddenly I, this rebel got some revelation and that's when I came out of the east and came looking for Jesus. And some other, somebody in this place would say, I was the reveler. I was the party goer. I was out there on the dance floor. I was doing the drugs and I was, I was getting drunk and I was doing my thing and I was, you know what, you know what I'm saying, I'm not trying to get too deep in here, this is a mixed crowd, but y'all know what I'm saying up in here. There's some old, there's some revelers in this place who got some revelation and came out of the lifestyle of reveling and came looking for Jesus. And then there's some others in here who say, I was the reject. I was the one who was sent away. I was the one whose daddy didn't want him. I was the one whose mama didn't want him. I was the one whose family didn't want him. I was the one who was sent away. I was sent out to the east, but I got some revelation that even if my daddy doesn't want me and my mama doesn't want me, God wants me. That, that even if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. I got some revelation, and so I came from the east. You see, wise men are still coming from the east. Even to this day, the rebels and revelers and rejects are still coming from the East. And what makes you a wise man or a wise woman is simply the decision to come looking for Jesus. Amen. They saw this star in the East and they got some revelation, but revelation is not enough. They had to go looking for Jesus. Do you realize that you could get all the revelation in the world, that God could open the windows of heaven and show you great and mighty things which you did not know, that the Holy Spirit could reveal to you deep things, the deep things of God, that he could answer every single one of your questions, that he could show you heavenly things. He could even reveal to you the exact history of all things from the beginning and end, and it would do you no good if you don't respond by going looking for Jesus. That, that revelation must be it requires a response. Revelation requires a response. And the response of the heart is simply to go looking for Jesus. Making the decision, I'm going to go looking for Jesus. And I don't care how long the journey takes. I don't care how much energy it's going to take. I don't care how far I have to travel. I must find Jesus. You see, revelation is the knowledge of the fact that the most important thing in my life is that I find Jesus. When revelation transpires, you recognize, you come to the realization that the only thing that matters in my life is that I find Jesus. And so they follow the star. And it seems that at some point the star disappears. And so somehow they got the revelation that he's born, number one, and that he's the king of the Jews. So if he's born and he's the king of the Jews, we just need to go to Judea. And what's the capital of Judea? Jerusalem. So if he's born for them, they must know all about this. We're going there so they can school us. And what, the, what they found when they got to Jerusalem is that everybody had re religion, but nobody had any relationship. Wow. Yeah. Everybody was going into the temple and making the sacrifices and, doing the, and meditating on the scripture, and they were doing all of this stuff, but nobody had any revelation about what God was doing right now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, where is he who has been born yeah. king of the Jews? Yeah. For we, seen, we have seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him, but the star disappeared. So can you direct us? Can you show us where to find him? Yeah, yeah. And the scripture says that when Herod heard this, he was troubled. Yeah. And all Jerusalem with him. Yeah. When Herod heard this, he was troubled. Wow. He was mad about it. Yeah. He was upset about it. He was scared. Yeah. He was distressed. It wasn't good news to him. Remember what we talked about on, on uh, Friday night, that this was good news, good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. But Herod hears it, and it's not good news to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because the revelation is that he's the king. Yeah. Yeah. Which means that he 
has the right to both ownership and rulership over your life. And if you have made the decision that you are going to maintain control over your own life, that's not good news to you. It's a conflict of interest. But when you recognize that the greatest level of freedom that you can experience is in surrendering to the one who created you, that surrendering to him is not a state of bondage, that rebellion to him, against him is actually bondage, yeah, yeah, yeah. when you get the revelation of this greatest paradox of the kingdom, yeah. that the greatest freedom is found in surrender to God, and the greatest bondage is found in rebellion against him. When you get, see, when you're living in rebellion, it feels like freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when someone preaches the gospel to you about surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and you're living in rebellion, it feels like bondage. Wow. But when God touches your heart and opens your heart and you get revelation, yeah. you begin to realize that the greatest freedom you can ever experience on this earth yeah. is complete surrender to God. Yeah. 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 And that if there is any level of bondage in your life, in any area of your life, yeah. it is always the result of lack of surrender to God. Yeah. Yeah. And once we get this revelation, we spend the rest of our lives learning how to submit more at greater and greater levels of completion. When I discern new areas of my life that are not surrendered to God, I surrender them immediately. But somehow these wise men from the east got that revelation. We have come to worship him, and the word simply means to completely surrender. And so here it goes. Give 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 me about 45 minutes. And he goes in the other room, he calls in the theologians, yeah. and he goes, I think they're talking about the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one prophesied by the prophets of old that he would come. I think they're saying that the Christ has been born, that the Messiah has been born. So you guys go to the scriptures and find out where he's supposed to be born. Yeah. And one of the theologians said, oh, that's easy. That's, what is it, Micah chapter 5, verse 6 or verse 4? But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small amongst the multitudes of Judah, yet out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel, and his going forths are from old. He's to be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. That's where the Messiah is supposed to be born. And then Herod comes out, and he tells the wise men, he's been born in Bethlehem. So you guys go on over to Bethlehem and search diligently till you find him. But when you find him, Come back and tell me where he is so I can worship him too. Isn't it interesting that the unbeliever told the believers where to find Jesus? The unbelievers in the church told the believers outside the church where to find the real Jesus. A lot of people are going to hell who have all the knowledge they needed know exactly where he is, know exactly where to find him, but still going to hell because you've made a decision not to surrender to him. Wow. Period. And there's going to be a lot of folks up there who never actually joined your church, never went through your membership program, don't know the songs that you sang because they simply made a decision in their hearts to surrender to him, which means coming to church and getting your butt in a seat will not save you. Neither will your dollar in the plate. The only thing that can save you is surrendering your heart to Jesus himself. And so the wise men, they come out of the presence of Herod. When they come out of the court of Herod, they say, we've got to go to Bethlehem. Now, okay, we've got to get a map. Somebody get a map. We've got to find our way to Bethlehem. And as soon as they come out of the court of Herod, they look up. Wait, wait, wait. Hey, Joe, check this out. Check it out, Bob. Check it out. The star that we saw back in the east, there it is. It's appeared again. They didn't need a map. They didn't need 
ways. And it said, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. The star is leading them to the place where they're going to surrender their lives to a baby. The star is leading them to a place where they're going to surrender everything. They're laying it all down. They're giving it all up. The right to my life. The right to control my future. The right to determine my destiny. The right to my decisions. When they saw this star that represented complete surrender to God, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Finally, we can surrender. Finally, we can let go of everything. Finally, we can cast down our golden crowns. Finally, we can give everything to God. This is what they were longing for. They rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And the star led them to Bethlehem and rested right over the house. Now they're in a house. They're not in the manger anymore. Probably some family members welcomed them in after some other family members left. Who knows? And it says, and when they came into the house, when they had come into the house, they opened up their treasures and they laid before him their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh. And then they laid on their faces and prostrated themselves before them. They had journeyed halfway across the world for one worship service. To be present before the feet of Jesus for one worship service. And when they got there, they worshiped him. They surrendered. They arise. The worship service is over. We found Jesus. What do we do now? Where do we go from here? Maybe we'll just relax here and take it easy. I saw a nice hotel down the street. Maybe we'll just get a room there or a couple rooms. I think they got a nice pool. Just relax, eat some good food. We need to send all our robes to the cleaners. Hopefully buy a few new robes. Oh, we gave him our gold. (laughs) But we need to, you know, take a vacation. I mean, we've journeyed a long way to get here. Now we deserve a rest. We've gone through a lot to get here for this worship service. Now that the worship service is over, we deserve a rest. And the angel of the Lord appears to them and says, no time for that. You got to get out of here right now, but make sure you don't go back the way you came. Where are we going? Back to your own country. Don't we get a rest? No, there's no time for rest. Y'all got to get up out of here right now because Herod is coming. And so the wise men They kiss the baby Jesus, they hug Mary and Joseph, they dap it up with whoever else is there, family members, whatever, and they go, we got to go. They journeyed all the way across the world, had one worship service, and then they had to get back on their camels or donkeys or whatever they rode in there with and head right back home immediately. There's no time to rest. Now, Mary is probably maybe a few days, maybe a week, maybe a couple weeks after delivering the baby Jesus, and they go to sleep that night. They're thinking, we're going to hang out here for a few months because we need to rest. We had to journey all the way here to have the baby, but now we've had the baby. I think we should just rest. I think we should just take it easy. We need to take a step back now. We need to take a deep breath. But all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, the angel appears to Joseph in the dream and says, Get up out of here right now. Wake up, Joseph. Pack the baby. Pack the mother. Pack your bags. Hop back on your camel, and you're getting out of here. But you know, you're not going back to Nazareth right now. You're going to Egypt. Lord, I'm too tired for another journey right now. We need to rest. Sorry, but there's no time to rest. Herod is mad. He's coming for the child right now. 
First there was no way, and then there was no time, and then there was no room, and now there's no rest. Have you ever found yourself in a moment where you needed rest more than anything? You needed a break, you needed to take a step back, and a crisis hits right at that moment. Just as my vacation started, You got five kids and your kids are making all kinds of mess and all kinds of noise and you just need one mommy vacation to go to a hotel in another city for one night just to just have one night away from the kids. Your husband agreed and then boom, a crisis hits and you have to cancel it at the last moment. There's no rest. Go right now. And Joseph woke up in the middle of the night, said, Mary, get up, pack the bag. Where are we going? we got to get out of here right now. Can't we wait till morning? Nope, can't wait till morning. We've got to go right now. It says that he woke them up, and they left in the middle of the night. No rest. Lord, what are you doing to me? Don't you see I can't take any more? Don't you see how overwhelmed I am? Don't you see how burdened and tired I am? Don't you see I'm still dealing with the last crisis? How can you let this crisis happen to me? Can't you see I almost paid off that debt? Now all of a sudden I've got to incur a new debt? You know how long it took me to pay off the new engine we had to put in the car? And now the the hot water heater dies and i got to buy hot water? Lord, there's no rest. It's one after the other, after the other, after the other. It rains and it pours and it rains and it pours. One crisis and another crisis and I'm just like a ping pong. A ping pong ball just from one side of the table and the Lord just keeps whacking me and whacking me and whacking me. And it's at moments like these that you start to feel abandoned by God. I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. It's moments like these where you start to feel forsaken by God. It's moments like these where you start to feel like God has cursed you. And then you start asking questions like, maybe God is punishing me for what I did back in 1986. I knew it would catch up with me one day. Maybe God's punishing me because I'm not holy enough or because I'm not righteous enough or I'm not pure enough. Can I tell you something? When God punishes you, you'll know. (laughs) Somebody wrote me recently and said, with this COVID thing, isn't it God's wrath? Isn't Isn't COVID God's wrath? Isn't he trying to kill us? And if so, by taking the vaccine, aren't we fighting against God? And my response was, listen, God doesn't try to kill anyone. He either kills you or he doesn't. There is no vaccine that can protect you from the wrath of God. So trust me, if a vaccine works, then God's wrath is not part of it. <laughs> I had a friend tell me one time, he said, I don't think I can believe in Jesus anymore. I said, why? He said, because I'm just too tired of God kicking me in the teeth. I said, my friend, I promise you, if God ever kicks you in the teeth, you will cease to exist. The fact that you have teeth left means that God has not kicked you in the teeth. Because we have a way of blaming God in the midst of our trials. And when we begin to blame God in the midst of our trials, we lose sight of the fact that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him. You see, the week before last, we talked about how that no time challenge was actually God positioning you for your destiny. What we don't realize is that there are two reasons why God moves you. God is always moving us, but there's two primary reasons why he moves us. The first reason why he moves us is to move you into a place of opportunity, blessing, and destiny. But the second reason why he moves you is to move you out of the way of a place of devastation and wrath. When you get woken up in the middle of the night and a crisis is moving you to the other side of the world, it's not because God's cursed you. It's because God's blessing is so strong on your life that he won't let you be there when Herod's wrath comes. 
He sees the danger coming that you don't see, and he's moving you out of the way of that danger. He sees the crisis coming that you... You see, there's some crises that God has ordained for you to walk through, and there's other crises that God has ordained for you to walk around. You hearing me? There's no rest. No, God's giving you rest. It's just going to take a little longer to get there than you thought. The crisis won't stop. Oh, no, God is actually moving you to a place where you're going to avert the crisis. Yes, yes. <laughs> and if yes. you don't believe him, just, just stay there. <laughs> just sit right there. Don't move when he tells you to move. See what happens. I'm tired of God kicking me in the teeth, so I'm just going to stay right here. Guess what happens? Next thing that happens is you get kicked in the teeth. But it wasn't God who kicked you in the teeth. God was trying to move you out of the way of the thing that was about to kick you in the teeth. Yeah, yeah. This is why surrender is so powerful. Yeah. Surrender is so powerful because when your heart is surrendered, yeah. you can hear God speak to you in the middle of the night yeah. and yeah. say, go. Yeah, yeah. And you go yeah. because you trust yes. that when God tells you to go, he's got your best interest in mind. Yeah. When you have surrendered to God, yeah. he can speak to you in the middle of the night and say, move, and you'll move. Yep. Give, and you'll give. Yep. Stop, and you'll stop. Yep. No, and you won't take it. Yep. Yep. There have been countless times, and my wife can attest, that between the two of us, there have been opportunities presented to us that seemed golden, and we heard the Lord say, no, yeah. don't take it. Because we trusted God, we said no. Yeah. And there have been times when the opportunity didn't look so hot. Yeah. And God said, yes. Yeah. The surrendered, they trust in the Lord with all their hearts. Yeah. And they lean not on their own understanding. They acknowledge him in all their ways, and he directs their paths. Amen. And so what am I saying to you today? Many of you are at a place right now in your life where it just feels like it just doesn't stop. No rest. Crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. Problem to problem to problem to problem. From one state of overwhelm to another. As soon as you get out of the frying pan, you're into the fire. And the word of the Lord to you is just a simple word of encouragement. All of this moving around, all of the chaos that seems to be transpiring around you, God is in it. He's protecting you. He's preserving you. Preserving you for blessing that he has prepared for you. Preserving you so that when it's time for you to sit down at the table and eat, there's something left of you to actually sit at the table and eat. He sees the enemy wanting to take a chunk out of your behind. I know it feels like there's no rest. But when you walk in faith and you make the decision to walk in faith, yeah. you find your rest in him. Amen. And all of us, we keep looking for our rest in the circumstance. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to rest when I figured out the propane tank and the, the electricity thing. And <laughs> the HELOC. Whatever. When I figure out childcare, then I can rest. When I figure out the job situation, then I can rest when my but no, Jesus says, come to me. Yeah, yeah. It's a call to wise men. Yeah. Come to me. Yeah. All you who are weary and heavy laden. And he just does not say, and I will change your situation. 
He does not say, come to me and I'll fix your problem. No, 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 no. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I promise you I'll give you rest. I promise you I'll be your rest in the midst of the storm. I promise you that at the moment where you feel like you've got no strength, you just come to me and I'll be your strength. I promise you. When you say, I can't hold on any longer, come to me and I'll hold you. Come to me. I am your rest. I am your rest. I will be your rest. I will be strength for the journey. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. You're not alone. You're not forsaken. You're not by yourself. You haven't lost everything until you lose me, and you can't lose me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Seek me and live. That's what he's saying. Seek me and live. Turn to me. Look to me. Lift up your eyes above the situation, above the trial, above the tribulation, above the storm. I am here. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That's his promise to you today. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Why do you say, O Jacob? And why do you speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. And my just cause is passed over by my God. Have you not seen? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning that the Lord, the everlasting God, is the creator of the ends of the earth, that his understanding is unsearchable? He gives strength to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. That even young men shall stumble and youths shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and shall not faint. He is your strength. I don't need the trial to change. I need my heart to change. I don't need the situation to be different. I need my heart to be different. That every time I think the trial has to change the situation, God says, no, let me touch you on the inside. Watch this. And he just turns a dial in your heart. I say, oh, that's different. It's different because I'm different. And when you make the decision to live this way, you know what happens? The trial begins to work good for you. You begin to look back on the trial and say, I wouldn't have this blessing without that trial. Your relationships get better because of the trial. You're closer to your wife. You're closer to your husband. You're closer to your kids because of the trial. You become more fruitful because of the trial. You become more aware of the good that's coming out of it than the evil that's in the midst of it. And all of a sudden, you don't even look at it as a trial anymore. You don't look back and see the trial. You see it as seed. Seed that's planted in the earth. But Jesus said, unless the kernel of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it can bear no fruit. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. God is with you in the midst of the trial. Bow your heads with me and let's pray.